Uh, welcome everybody. I am delighted to see many of your faces tonight and I look forward to meeting some of you later if you'd like to stay for the breakout rooms. I'm the director of Theos and if you're new to us we are a religion and society think tank with a Christian basis. We exist to make the debate about the role of Christianity in particular and religion in general more informed, more accurate, hopefully more gracious. And we do that through rigorous research, like the project we're going to hear about tonight, through events like this, like through podcasts, media commentary, and a lot of other things. If think tanks are research organizations with a perspective, ours is that religious communities and the wisdom that they steward are gifts, not threats, friends, not foes, even or perhaps especially in plural societies, where lots of people are non-religious and we believe, belong and behave in an ever increasing range of ways. In recent years, we've published research on science and religion, RE, chaplaincy, inequality, religion on university campuses and why London is getting more, not less religious. And I hope you'll go uh, check out the back catalogue on the website. Tonight, our focus is squarely on a three year project specifically about the Church of England. We have been delighted to partner with the Church Urban Fund on this project that's really seeking to understand what the Church of England looks like today on the ground and how three particular strands, often thought of as separate, work together. Growth, social action and discipleship. And in a moment, I'm going to hand over to the Church Urban Fund's Bishop in Residence, Bishop Adrian Newman, who will tell you a bit more about the project. We will hear the findings of the research from uh, Theos' researcher, Hannah Rich, and then we will hear from a smorgasbord of eminent respondents from across the church before opening up from some questions from you. I am going to kick off the main event and hand over to Bishop Adrian. Well, on behalf of the Church Urban Fund, allow me to offer you a very warm welcome indeed to this very significant and important evening as we launch the GRACE project. Um, it's a piece of research between the Church Urban Fund and Theos, which they've been doing, I think it's fair to say, on behalf of the wider church for the past three years. And in a moment, I'm going to hand over to the Archbishop of York through the wonders of technology to introduce uh, the evening itself. But before then, I hope you'll indulge me just in a few brief words about the Church Urban Fund itself. For the best part of 35 years, uh, I have um, been in ministry focused on Christian social action. And all the way through from my curacy back in the East End of London in the mid 1980s, right the way through to returning to my beloved East End as Bishop of Stepney many years later, the Church Urban Fund has been a constant companion to me. It has been for the Church of England an insistent voice calling the church to justice, to mercy and to prophetic action in the name of Jesus Christ. And many of you will know that the roots of the Church Urban Fund are to be found in the seminal 1985 report, Faith in the City, a report that inspired my calling and many people of my generation. It called the church to place social action and social justice right at the heart of the church's mission. And Cuff was launched a couple of years later to catalyze and to resource the Church of England in their practical response to poverty and inequality across England. And it's been doing it ever since. Um, it's been helping churches engage with the real issues within their local communities. Issues like um, homelessness, loneliness, isolation, food poverty, community cohesion, financial inclusion, and uh, so much more besides. And 33 years later, they're still doing um, exactly the same work, but in different ways. So uh, just as one simple example, by Christmas, the Together Network will have uh, upskilled around about a thousand community trainers through delivery of something called the COVID cash course. So that's a free signposting and information workshop. And those local champions will then go on and support over 10,000 people uh, in their local communities to prevent their current financial challenges becoming financial crises. And that's just one small example of some of the amazing work that Cuff is doing on behalf of the wider church, often, as I say, completely below the radar as far as the Church of England is concerned. But theologically, what excites me about the work that Cuff does and therefore about the project tonight is this. In all that Cuff does, 
from at one end of the spectrum influencing national social policy right the way through at the other end of the spectrum to initiating direct social action. Cuff is encouraging people onto the, what I, well, I call it, a dance floor between the church and the kingdom of God, drawing the church into the dance of the kingdom and the kingdom into the dance of the church. And that's why a research project like this one for Grace uh, on the dynamic between church growth and discipleship and social action sits so squarely within the remit of what Cuff is about, within its role, within its identity, within the Church of England, because this is dance floor territory. And so without any further ado, let's get into the action tonight and let's dance. A couple of months ago, I was with someone and they asked me, oh, what are your priorities as the next Archbishop of York? And uh, I found myself saying, oh, well, just evangelism, just prayer. Uh, uh, and as I said those words, just evangelism, just prayer, it's not an original thought, I know, but it reminded me of the interrelationship between spirituality, evangelism, discipleship, and social action and social transformation. In the Christian tradition, these things always go together. The heart of our prayer is a prayer that God's kingdom will come on earth. And the reason that we share the gospel is not to build up the earthly empire of the church, but to make disciples who are themselves active and participative with God in bringing about a transformation of the world. So it's a great honour to be standing here to help launch the GRACE project. A lot of research has been going on into this relationship between social action, discipleship and church growth. Seeing how these things belong together and learning how we can be a missionary church in everything we do. Just evangelism and just prayer and working for God's kingdom of justice and peace here on earth. Thank you so much, um, Bishop Stephen, um, Archbishop Stephen, thank you so much, Bishop Adrian. We are gonna hand over now to Hannah Rich, who is going to present the findings of the Grace Project, the headline. Some of you will have had a chance to read it. Uh, some of you won't, there is a lot um, of data in there and a huge amount of stories. So I encourage you to go and read it if you can, but Hannah's gonna give us just a little taster. Thanks, Liz. We should also have some slides, I hope. Great. Um, so there is a key paradox, I think, facing the Church of England in 2020. The nation is uh, increasingly needs civil society in general, and the Church of England more specifically, but is also less spiritually connected to it than ever. Church of England attendance, we know, has fallen by between 15 and 20 percent in the last decade, however you measure it. Uh, but in the same period, we've seen food banks become rooted in our national socioeconomic infrastructure, not to mention a growth in other forms of social action even prior to COVID-19. In 2019, so last year, 77% of parishes were involved in one or more forms of social action. And it's into this perceived paradox that this report, Growing Good, speaks. It's an ambitious um, and extensive project that's taken us three years to complete. It's been a mixed method piece of research combining uh, qualitative and quantitative research, so stories and statistics, to present a comprehensive picture of what the Church of England is and what it might be. Um, I won't do an Oscars style speech here, but the list of people involved is absolutely huge. Many of you are here tonight um, and I'm grateful for all of you who shared your time and your wisdom to making this happen. In particular, um, everyone at Church Urban Fund, especially Jessamine, um, who's been fantastic in making this possible. But the key question is that of how do social action, discipleship and church growth fit together on the ground? Uh, or to use Bishop Adrian's wonderful analogy, what does the dance look like? And um, so I'll start by describing some of the qualitative findings, then I'll talk a little bit about the quantitative work, 
Then I'm going to hand over to uh, Reverend Graham Hunter from St John's Church in Hoxton, which is one of the case studies in the research, to talk a little bit about what the, re what the report might mean in his parish context, and then I'll outline some of the recommendations and some of our hopes going forward. So to the qualitative phase, the stories. Um, over an 18 month period, we carried out over 350 interviews in 66 parish communities. And in sampling these, the aim was always that anyone uh, looking at the list of parishes or indeed reading the report would see their own parish context reflected more or less. We worked really hard to ensure that the sample uh, included diversity of size, context, church tradition, demographic, geography, growth trend, the lot. Um, and ultimately included at least one case study in every diocese um, and you can see on the map the red dots on the map um, are all the case studies that were involved in this research and all of the qualitative research took place uh, pre-pandemic so the final interview was in December 2019 which was just before any of us were aware what was coming uh, and in writing this report during the first lockdown this year it's been really interesting for me to reflect on uh, quite how much has been turned upside down by this year and yet, if anything, I think many of the findings have become more rather than less pertinent as a result. So from our analysis of this qualitative data, we find that social action is often a route to church growth in both numerical and spiritual terms. This isn't to suggest that there is one uh, single or infallible way to grow a church. And neither am I saying that there's some sort of magic equation in which doing X social project leads to Y growth. However, the research has identified um, a set of core characteristics that we think are consistent about congregations that are growing in number and going deeper in discipleship through their engagement with their community in social action. And the first of these is presence. We find that the church grows in number and depth when it is present in and connected to its local area. And this may often be manifested through its social action. It's an oft repeated uh, gift of the Church of England that it has a presence in every community, uh, geographically speaking, but we find it also that this is important that it is known. So it matters not only that the church is present and is doing good, but also that people are aware of it. Uh, in a number of our case studies, growth, numerical growth, began from uh, communicating that the church was still open when local residents had assumed from uh, the physical presence of it that it was not. Being a presence in every community also requires courageous commitment uh, to places where this is less easy. For example, persisting in resourcing a church in a parish where growth isn't currently happening and where other churches or of other denominations have left um, in faith that it's worth it. There's a quote in the report from someone that said that uh, sometimes victory looks like staying. Um, and I think that's really relevant. And that brings me to the second characteristic, which is perseverance. If the church's community presence remains important, uh, despite declining national affiliation, then the perseverance and long term nature of this is a key reason why. Congregational growth often occurs after years of focused activity or engagement in meeting the needs of a community. And particularly in more deprived communities, although not exclusively so, the long term commitment of the church contrasts starkly with the approach of statutory organisations and charities which may only work in an area for a short time and then leave when the initiative's funding changes. In some cases, which don't lend themselves to growth, the church can mirror these patterns, but it also has the capacity to challenge them. The church can represent a consistent, consistent community leadership of the, of the sort not always enjoyed by other groups or institutions. Uh, for example, one vicar in the research told us they'd worked with four different head teachers in five years at the local primary school and the vicar had been the same throughout all of those of those five years. When growth arises from relationships, which we think is really key, it's natural that this will take time and perseverance. Statistical measures of church growth then that equate the church with the weekly congregation don't necessarily capture the groundwork and the investment that's gone on in someone's life prior to that point. And the analogy developed by a number of participants in the research is that of a plant. So the point at which um, the shoots of growth are seen above the ground is not actually the point at which the plant starts growing. And I don't think you need to be a brilliant gardener to get that point. Um, and similarly, the, the point at which church growth is visible above the ground in numbers is not necessarily the point at which the church begins to grow, uh, nor the point where the work begins. And I think this is both an encouragement for congregations uh, engaged in the slow and faithful work of loving their community but also a challenge to church funding structures that might be tempted to pursue uh, more short-term strategies. 
The next two characteristics of churches growing through their social action are hospitality and generosity. And I'll talk briefly about those together. Both hospitality and generosity communicate uh, the genuine willingness of the congregation to invest in and uh, to engage with and invest in the community as it is. And this is as much about congregational culture and the way in which uh, social action is practiced as it is the activity involved. Um, a number of social action projects can demonstrate hospitality. They can also be done in a way that is slightly more transactional and doesn't express that culture and that heart of hospitality. But we heard the example of a church which has grown significantly uh, through extending the post-service midweek coffee to become an act of hospitality for the whole community. Really simply um, just offering, inviting other people in for that coffee uh, and, and seeing the church grow as a result. The next thing I'd like to talk about is um, adaptability. This is really key. So where the church is growing and flourishing through its involvement in social action, the congregation's capacity to adapt and embrace complexity is really critical. The circumstances that may have led someone to engage with the church's social action might also have implications for their discipleship and for the life of the church in ways that can challenge sometimes the status quo of a church community. It can have practical implications for people's ability to commit time and energy to the church. This can be an opportunity rather than a barrier for the growth of the church, but it does require a level of um, compassion and resilience from within the church. For example, one church we uh, encountered where the majority of lay leaders in the church are also shift workers. And this is reflected in the degree of flexibility with which they simply have to handle Sunday morning rotors, timekeeping, people's ability to commit to meetings and things. And another important dimension of this is the need for uh, congregational resilience and an openness to lament. For example, one community uh, told us that a key part of their social action was holding funerals for rough sleepers who'd been involved in their homelessness work. There is also the lament and the disappointment of investing time and love in a person uh, through social action and through relationship, whose circumstances then see them leave the church for whatever reason. But ultimately, if the church is recognised as a place where it is acceptable to bring the messiness and the complexity of your life um, and admit when things are difficult, we think it's more likely to be a place people feel they want to join. And lastly, the, but by no means least, the invitation to participate. And in some ways, I think this is uh, the most interesting finding and certainly something I hadn't anticipated going into the research. Participation in social action can also offer a really practical route into faith for people who weren't previously part of the church community and might not even have considered um, exploring faith before. We heard numerous stories of people who were drawn to the church primarily to volunteer because they wanted to give something back, um, who then became part of the church community and discovered faith. And in most cases, I think it's worth saying that these were not individuals who would have um, necessarily responded to the invite to an alpha course or an explicitly um, faith-based activity of the sort that congregations are very quick to associate with um, the, the sort of thing you might invite your friends to. It's important therefore that uh, as we recommend, congregations are encouraged to see social action as a primary site of invitation as well. So then to complement the insights of this extensive qualitative data and these interviews, we had also planned to conduct a national survey of Anglican congregations. Unfortunately, uh, because of COVID-19, we were not able to proceed with a congregational survey quite as planned. However, we were able to conduct um, fresh analysis of the national statistics and mission data that already exists, along with a smaller scale survey in Liverpool diocese. Um, and I should say at this point, we owe a particular gratitude to Ellen Loudon, to the Archdeacon and to the deaneries involved. Um, and also to the Church of England Research and Statistics team for their efforts in making a survey possible in May of 2020, which was, um, needless to say, quite a busy time for everybody. So it's important to be clear that given what I've just explained, um, we can't draw any nationally representative conclusions from this data. Um, it's, it's simply not nationally representative. It's data from um, 22 churches in three deaneries in Liverpool. However, it does point us in the direction, I think, of some really important trends which are borne out by the quality of data we've already discussed, and which I think we might expect to see in a larger sample as well. Okay, the things that we wouldn't, um, we would have expected perhaps to have seen had we been able to do the full scale survey as planned. So to highlight a few of these, 52% um, of people agreed or strongly agreed that they first met people who worshiped at that particular church uh, through church-based community activities. 
82% agreed or strongly agreed that their church's community action had brought together people from the existing congregation and the wider community. And 79% said they'd made friends through volunteering in church-based community action. And that increased to 86% of participants um, over the age of 65. So there are perhaps some implications there for thinking about loneliness and isolation um, in later life. We also included, given the, the timing, questions about the effects of the pandemic on the church's social action. And 33% uh, of people told us they thought their church would be more engaged with the community as a result or after the pandemic. 59% said they thought their church would be more aware of the community's needs. And 36% felt their church would be more able to offer support. And this is in the context of um, a participant sample who was seen to be quite highly engaged or more highly engaged than the general population to begin with, uh, based on responses to a question about what activities they were already involved in. So uh, these are people who say that they think they'll be able to do more, although they're already doing a reasonable amount. There was also a degree of realism, I think, in these findings. So not all of those who felt their church would be more aware of the community's needs, felt they would also be uh, more able to offer support and more engaged, suggesting that respondents are mindful of limitations on their capacity. And this was also apparent in the difference between um, under 65s and over 65s in their perception of their personal capacity to be involved. So we asked about whether they were more or less involved than before the pandemic um, and similar questions to that. And that's perhaps due to the, um, or there's a slight generalization, um, due to the age related restrictions of shielding during the pandemic. So that's a brief uh, rundown of some of the findings. Uh, and for more in-depth insight into what this looks like in practice, I'm now going to hand over to Reverend Graham Hunter from uh, St John's Hoxton, who these uh, brilliant people you can see on the slide are part of his congregation. Um, and they were one of the case studies in the research. I'm going to ask Graham to speak for a few minutes about some of the things that I've already shared um, and what they look like in his context. Um, and then I'll talk about the recommendations. So over to you, Graham. Amazing. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, it's so good to be here with you all. And so lovely to see some of my dear friends on the screen. You can see that's Besede, David and Emmanuel uh, and our church tower and broken clock. Um, and uh, you can read about their stories in the report. Um, I really enjoyed reading the report. I really commend it to you. I'm still mulling it over and thinking about what I make of the recommendations, but I found it incredibly affirming to read a report which um, supported so many other things uh, and put bones beneath the flesh, I suppose, of what we very often do quite intuitively and instinctively here. And maybe just to try and ground it in reality uh, in, in our local context uh, here in Hoxton, inner city Hackney, um, I might just mention numbers, new life and neighbourhood. Uh, as a way of thinking about the interaction between these different themes. Um, last Sunday on the 1st of November, I celebrated 10 years here as vicar at St. John's Hoxton. And uh, when I began, it felt like an episode of Rev. We had 10 or 15 people gathering on a Sunday morning um, at various stages uh, of the service, including tea and coffee after the service. Um, and it was pretty chaotic and uh, frenetic and dysfunctional, uh, lovely, but uh, dysfunctional. We're now a worshiping community of around 300, 300 150 adults and children, uh, which has been extraordinary in, in 10 years. And most of our growth has been from open de-churched returners uh, and unchurched converters uh, for those for whom that language means anything. What that does mean is that for many, we're there, we are their only experience of church, or at least their only experience of an Anglican church. Now, of course, uh, the numbers uh, who come to church, as it were, on a Sunday has changed dramatically this year. We started the year seeing around 200 adults and children across three services, and now we have one online service and we have no idea really how many come. But, but we have learned to measure fruitfulness uh, and the health of the church in very different ways. And although attendance has been dramatically reduced in this season, in many ways, I think our church is more healthy and fruitful in mission than it has been in quite a while. And that's really because however important numbers are, it's the new life, it's the transformed lives that matter. They're only part of the story, the numbers. What really matters are the transformed people transforming our neighbors. You can read a bit about Besede, David and Emmanuel uh, in the report, but I wanted to just mention three others uh, who, whose stories I think really reflect uh, the kind of uh, report that Hannah and the team have put together. Uh, Colleen is a member of our congregation who um, came into our church, not really a Christian, not really believing, but wanting to belong in community and felt safe enough to speak to a summer intern uh, eight years ago or so about her own struggles with uh, personal debt with payday lending. 
Um, and through that conversation, that initial conversation, she became involved in a piece of work with um, Hackney Citizens and Community Organising, uh, and then indeed with the Archbishop of Canterbury's Credit Champions, Champions Initiative, became free from debt and became involved in campaigning uh, for more economic justice for people, single mums like hers. Uh, to crew, young lad who grew up in the church, uh, church family, but had never really connected um, his friendships in the neighbourhood with the life of the church. Church was just something you did on a Sunday morning. When he got towards the end of his schooling, he was struggling academically, had slightly underperformed, invested all of his time in pursuing football, a very, very talented footballer, um, but had a lack of opportunity. And uh, we took a chance on him when he was just 18 and struggling and um, put him in charge of the Saturday morning youth football project, which uh, in fact a role that Emmanuel, you can see in the screen is now taking up and taking on. Uh, and uh, so Chukwu found himself invited into the church leadership team and, and structure. And before long, he was taking on the midweek group as well and starting to make connections between how the relationships he built with the kids playing football on a Saturday enabled him to invite them to come to a midweek group and then on to a youth group at the weekend where perhaps there might be an exploration of faith. And then Amanda, uh, an, a mum who is an old East Ender, rejected from her wider family because of an interracial relationship. So very tough con context for her. Uh, coming into a uh, Ivy Street, a local family centre, um, staffed and supported, resourced by uh, Christians in the church, supporting uh, single mums, young families, parents, children, and uh, just doing hospitality and care. And she found herself being befriended by this group of Christians and had never set foot uh, in our church, had never been to church before and came into the church and experienced and encountered Jesus. And indeed, um, two of those three were confirmed by Bishop Adrian uh, some years ago. So that's really delightful. So much of our work uh, with people and transformation has centered around the processes of community organizing, broad-based community organizing with Citizens UK, building relational culture, uh, taking action for change that's been rooted in listening, and a commitment to developing leaders through action. Uh, and we're now continuing these strands of work through an organizing the growth project. And then just finally, let me end quickly with this neighborhood. Church growth theorists for decades have claimed that the only sure and certain way of uh, establishing church growth is to go for the homogenous unit principle, the homogenous growth principle, or, or to shun parish and embrace network. And uh, we say, nine, no, uh, we're not doing that. That's not for us. And we've been really intentional about being a neighborhood church. 85% of our worshiping community walk to church in under 15 minutes. We're multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multicultural, and local. We're a diverse church in every sense. We have leave voters and remain voters in our congregation. And uh, there, I believe that there's a real possibility for fruitful mission in the hyper-local, but it will have to shun any victim mentality and be serious and realistic about the scale of the task. And the sorts of uh, attributes that Hannah has identified and um, exp expounded for us are going to have to be picked up in the way we uh, identify recruit, deploy, train, develop leaders, looking at perseverance, patience, resilience, presence, adaptability, all of those kinds of things. Uh, and I really believe that um, this report will help maybe the neglected middle uh, in sort of churches in inner city environments. Those are maybe not the kind of small struggling parish churches or the large city center churches, but those who are just trying to do the faithful work of mission in neighborhoods uh, to really keep on going. Um, I, I could say more about bonding capital and bridge capital, but we'll save that for later. Thank yeah. you, Hannah, again. Thanks, Graham. Well, uh, plenty to, to reflect on there, but it falls to me now to um, make some recommendations. And there are plenty um, of these. There are plenty of things that we hope people will take away from this report, learn from um, and hopefully implement. But just some brief recommendations. Firstly, we recommend um, for the local church that the local church should think more strategically about the potential of its social action and volunteering to lead to growth. Uh, this would look like a church that is as quick to invite its neighbours to join in with its social action as it is to invite them to come to a church service or an evangelism course. Where this has happened, and there are examples of it in the research, um, churches are often really surprised by it. Uh, for example, the church which wrote to local residents to let them know about a night shelter it was hosting uh, for rough sleepers, mainly in order to kind of ward off complaints from the local residents, but were really stunned to receive um, loads of offers of help and people wanting to join in. Um, and we think this should become the norm. It shouldn't be surprising that that is a way in which the church community grows. 
Churches should also um, explicitly include the relationship between social action and discipleship uh, in their preaching and their teaching, whether this is Sunday sermons, teaching series, small group studies um, or other resources, in a way that would um, equip congregations to connect their faith with their action more. We suggest as well that particularly uh, for the Church of England, this could be tied in with the church calendar and with liturgy. It doesn't have to be too complicated. It doesn't have to be really clunky and forced. Um, a brilliant example is one vicar who did a treasure hunt uh, in an all age service at Epiphany, where the, the, the missing baby Jesus from the crib uh, turned up in the food bank collection box. And this led to a brilliant discussion on why that might be where Jesus is found. Congregations should also be encouraged to reflect um, on how the culture of their social action helps or hinders their growth and discipleship. As the findings show, um, how social action is approached and how it happens is as important in engendering growth as what happens. It's not about doing a food bank and you'll get growth, doing a toddler group and you won't. It's about how these things are addressed. Um, and to this end, there are questions at the end of several of the chapters, which we hope will help um, start conversations, but are very much not uh, limited to those questions. And then at a national level, just briefly, we recommend, um, as Graham's touched on, that the Church of England develops an additional metric of congregation size or growth. It's quite evident from the research that the current ones, um, although they're valuable in many ways, don't adequately capture um, a lot of the growth that is occurring and where it's occurring. 2020 has uh, prompted a rethink of how things are counted anyway. Um, after all, there has been no usual Sunday in this uh, most unusual of years. And so a new metric might inc include, for example, uh, the number of volunteers or the number of people who come into the church building each week or the number of people who interact with the church in some way. Um, the worshiping community metric, which is already used, um, kind of hints towards that, but we think it could go further. This year, there's a clear recognition that churches should be um, enabled to report what they've done this year that they are proud of in a way that can be celebrated, whether that is qualitatively or quantitatively. Um, which is an approach we welcome and in fact something I think this report would have recommended pandemic or not. Um, and further to this we recommend that any measurement of church growth uh, should be contextual however it's measured. So at present there's no um, integration of parish population data with congregation data. For example there's no attempt to gauge whether um, the growth of a congregation is because there's a new housing estate been built in the parish or conversely whether the declining attendance um, is because of an aging congregation. Similarly for um, many parishes classed as inconclusive, that means they're not growing or declining, statistically speaking, um, it may be in fact that they have grown and declined several times over because of population churn and um, people have moved, people have come in. Um, and again, sometimes victory does look like staying, sometimes growth looks like staying the same size. Um, and more contextual ways of tracking growth would benefit the church in that regard. Uh, and we also recommend that funding and resourcing structures need to accommodate that. And lastly, um, at an institutional level, we suggest that a national volunteering service might be spearheaded by the Church of England. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, in the last lockdown, so earlier on this year, if you cast your minds back, uh, we saw a million people sign up to be NHS volunteer responders. There was a lot of noise around this and it was a national scheme, but actually a tiny fraction of those were ever called upon. I know people myself who signed up and were never um, asked to, 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 to do anything. And this is patently not because the need wasn't there, um, but because the, the, the scheme that was set up lacked the coordinating and mobilizing power in every community which the church has. The church has that perseverance and all of the things that we've outlined, that understanding of the need and is really well placed to um, mobilize volunteers in ways that are really helpful in a way that um, actually the NHS scheme didn't prove to be. And so I want to end with uh, this quote from Middle March by George Eliot, uh, which I included at the start of the report and it's where it takes its title from, uh, Growing Good. The growing good of the Church of England, um, and indeed it's good growth, is I think in a thousand seemingly unhistoric acts of social action and in the vast number of congregations living a faithful life in response to their community. Our research shows that churches can and do grow through social action, but also that people are discipled through social action. It's not for nothing that um, faithfully is the adjective that defines the lives of those mentioned in this quote. This isn't a silver bullet for church growth, but perhaps it, isn't, it also isn't quite as paradoxical as it might have seemed at the start. In a year of much change and much challenge uh, for both the nation and the church, it is maybe worth asking ourselves if the future of the Church of England and its growth might well lie in social action. 
Hannah, thank you so much. Well, as I said, that's all available in the uh, report, which you is now available to download. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll be hearing uh, much more about it over the coming weeks and months. But we have asked a few people to have a read of it in advance, some of whom have known that it's coming for a while. Um, and we're gonna ask for some short responses for them now. And we're gonna kick off uh, with Father Richard Springer, who is Rector at St. George in the East Shadwell, and also part of the Centre for Theology and community. Over to you, Father Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to participate this evening. Um, I follow uh, Graham Hunter, who is a priest that I know well and a church that I know well, and a bit of me is wishing uh, that perhaps one of my lay people, I say my lay people, one of the lay people in our church uh, might have offered some reflections instead of another priest um, from not very far away from Hoxton. So I hope there's something uh, in what I say that's useful. Um, I really want to start off by saying that I really enjoyed reading this report. Um, I find myself in agreement with lots of the promptings of the research and particularly obviously the focus on the greater integration of discipleship and social action uh, together with church growth and it's probably the conversation in our congregation at the moment which is enriching us the most. It's the most persistent one within our staff and clergy team, but also among uh, the congregation as well, although they don't use those terms, as is uh, pointed out regularly in the report, people might not use these words, uh, but they, these things are going on. So um, thank you for this report. Um, I've been asked to just offer a few reflections on, my, on the findings uh, based on my own context. I speak just for where I am and what I know. Um, and I was struck uh, by the first few sentences initially in the executive summary. Um, I have read the whole report, but the, the executive summary did uh, point out that many in the nation uh, are, aren't aware of this connection between social action in the church and perhaps its spiritual roots. And I was immediately thinking, do we as the church, do I as a priest recognize clearly uh, in a way that I can readily describe Does my congregation understand that connection? Uh, and how I, might we explore that more? And that was connected to uh, the thought that volunteering as an idea is quite an interesting lens with which to use the activity of people in the church uh, who might not use that word, but are they actually volunteering? I was really curious to explore that and hope that uh, some of our discussion tonight might explore that a little bit. I'm certainly interested in that as opposed to say ministry. In fact, somebody in my team who doesn't know anything about this report was saying to me the other day, why does the Church of England, he's Roman Catholic, always talk about volunteering instead of ministry? So um, that came to mind. But obviously there are people uh, who, are who are volunteering in church activities um, who aren't, don't yet see themselves as members of congregations, uh, including the congregation where I am serving. Um, and I'm really curious to, to find out where volu when volunteering was uh, started to emerge as the, uh, as the language with which to describe the social action of church congregations and what has dropped out. Um, it might well be before my time as a priest is only a few years. Um, I was also struck uh, by uh, the, the door that I think the report opens through to justice. I was amazed by the percentage of, uh, of churches involved in food banks, 93% in some way involved in food banks. And I wonder what that door, uh, should we wish to push it, might open up uh, for the church to be more prophetic, particularly around food poverty. Um, there are lots of issues that the Church of England can't purport, currently race being one, uh, to offer insight into. But if 93% of our churches are tackling food poverty and hunger in their neighbourhoods. It seems to me there's something collective and prophetic to say. Um, I don't know what the mechanisms are for enabling that to happen, um, but I suspect there's a lot of power in that. Uh, in my own parish context, I am um, uh, was moved to think about uh, what it might be for the church to see the poorest at its heart. So rather than just hearing the stories of the poorest and being near to the poorest, uh, what it might be to start to see uh, those, those people as the church themselves, not just giving us insights to offer back uh, to our own congregations. And I know that this report is advocating 
for that. I'm not saying it's not, but I'm, I, I think as a church leader, uh, that is a particular challenge always um, within the Church of England to change the language and the lens from uh, aiding the poor to seeing the church as the poor, as uh, that epiphany uh, object lesson was trying to show uh, where the vicar is looking for Jesus and finding him in the food bank. Um, of the characteristics of a church uh, that interested me most, I think adaptability uh, I would want to highlight, I think that was really interesting. Uh, leaders learning to encourage congregations to embrace complexity, uh, an opportunity to realize that these stories are the stories of the church, uh, not just the stories that the church is listening to. I'm sort of making the same point, but I think it's a really important one about uh, the way in which Christians are able to deal with complex situations. I think through this pandemic, um, something that I've been exercised by is in seeing uh, people who are materially poorer uh, deal with their faith in a pandemic in a way uh, which is quite different to the angst perhaps of some of the middle class Christians that I know. Um, and that's because faith has been forged in a slightly different context and there's a real gift in that um, that the church at large could gain from. Last couple of points from me uh, before I finish. Um, I, I, I want to reiterate the point about seeing social action as a potential site for discipleship and invitation. Um, I, I wonder whether actually those that participate in social action uh, are, are prime for the opportunity for reflecting on what it means spiritually. And I think that that is the, the big task. Um, so yes, a site for invitation, but also I wonder whether a site for discipleship. Can I as a church leader make the connection between why we're doing good things and who Jesus Christ is. Um, and uh, that's quite a challenge. Um, it's easy to avoid, um, but that is the task I think of the church and church leaders. And I think I have to stop there, so I will. Thank you so much, Father Richard. I'm gonna hand straight over uh, to Bishop Philip North, who is Bishop of Burnley. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And thank you to everyone responsible for this really rich report. It's a very, very splendid read, I think. It's full of wonderful, authentic stories. Um, its section on hospitality um, is one of the best things I've read on that subject. It was like, it was so easy to read. It's just like absorbing a delicious cream bun or something. It was a great read, so thank you for it. When in Luke chapter 13, Jesus met the bound woman, he utterly transformed every single area of her life. He transformed her physical being such that she could stand her back unbound. He transformed her material circumstances. She could earn, she could marry, she could make her own way economically. And she transformed her spiritual life as well. She got up this bound woman and she sung the song of the kingdom to the crowd standing round. Jesus ministered in a moment to the whole person, the whole of her humanity. Well, that was Jesus, but somehow we've allowed false dichotomies between the physical and the spiritual to creep in as this report analyzes so intelligently. And that's, I think, heretical, actually. The very incarnate person of Jesus, he who was both human and divine, both physical and spiritual, in his very self demonstrates the falsity of that dichotomy. Jesus divides a broken humanity, both in his own being and in the way he ministers to the broken. So I really welcome the much more cohesive approach to mission that this report calls for as we begin to see identify the links that many of us knew were there between church growth and social action. It's something which the Estates Evangelism Task Group, which I chair, has been calling for ever since our work began. Estates churches show the way, I would argue, in holding together social action and church growth, simply because they don't have the luxury of being able to do anything else. On an estate, you can't tell someone about Jesus if they're hungry or if they can't feed their children. If you try and do that, they'll just tell you where to go. But if you just feed them and refuse or fail to tell them about Jesus Christ, it's a con job. You're putting food in people's stomachs, but you're still leaving them hungry, hungry for the living bread. But looked through the lens of the estate's church, I'm left with two questions that I hope we can address as this report is received and discussed. This is by no means a critique 
and trying rather greedily to set the agenda. I'm sure this report will result in really rich debate and I hope rich action locally and nationally. So I'm trying to set some of the agenda as that conversation kicks off. First, I'd love to know what it would mean to push even further at that misleading distinction between social action and evangelism. And by the way, I think the word evangelism is one that we need to claim much more confidently. Because what do we want to see as Christians? It's not just the survival of the institutional church. It's not even just a bigger church. No, in Luke 13, we see what we want to see as Christians, which is a transformed world. What we want to see is a world where poverty is eradicated, a world where justice flows down, a world where we live in harmony with creation, a world where the beauty and dignity of every human person made in God's image is respected, and a world where the relationship between God and the people he made is healed and restored in Christ. That is the expansiveness of our vision. It's unbound, it's limitless, it's eternal. And so to share the good news of Jesus, to meet human need, to be a voice for justice, these are all one and the same. They're all the same business of seeking to transform the world under Christ. The early church would not have understood the distinctions that we make between service and proclamation, between social action and church growth. They just live the gospel. They just live like Jesus. So step one is narrowing the false dichotomy and which we can do, for example, by analyzing how social action and church growth relate as this report does. But the next step is surely just simply to eradicate it. So we minister without apology to the whole person. So we transform every aspect of a life as did Jesus with the bound woman. So that's the first thing to carry on unpicking that false uh, dichotomy. But the second question is really a bit of a reality check. Our research as the Estates Advantages and Task Group suggests that 50%, 50% of estates with 500 or more housing units have no church at all of any denomination. The church either has been shut down or it never was. And you can see behind me here, St. Mark's Church Hall, a church in this diocese, which very soon, sadly, we're going to have to close, hopefully later, replanting. So on those estates, 50% of estates, there is no social action and there's no church gro going on, no, no church growth going on. In fact, there's nothing going on. On half of our nation's social housing estates, it's pointless. It's a waste of time to theorise about what the church should or should not be doing because there isn't a church there. I can't help recalling the words of St Paul. How can they hear if there is no preacher? So what I'd love to see is some work and some reflection on what this report means for the church planting movement and how and why we should be prioritising planting back onto our estates and into our most deprived areas. If the church planting movement is to renew in the, a nation in the way it wants, it needs to start with the poorest communities, whereas all too often now it's starting with the most privileged. And those plants on our estates and urban areas will not have the luxury of being able to distinguish between social action and church growth. They'll need to live the whole gospel. And that means they can show the rest of us how to do it. So I hope this report is widely read, widely analysed, widely discussed across the church. It's certainly a much bouncier read than living in love and faith. But I hope also to see many more people thinking about what it means to see the evangelistic dimension of social action. But also, let's allow it to shape something of the life of the new church plants we need if we're to be a church for everyone, not just a church for the rich. Thank you, Bishop Philip. Um, we're going to hand over now to Grace Davey, who is a sociologist and professor emeritus at Exeter University for her reflections. And just before we go to Grace, I'd like to say I know most people are here tonight because they have a real stake in the Church of England, care deeply about the Church of England. But at Theos events, there are 
often joyfully lots of people who are neither Anglican nor Christian nor religious at all and are just interested in the ways that uh, in civil society and the ways that they, we live together with our differences so I just want to say we're really glad you're here if that's you and please do ask questions and engage because as the report argues this is not just about the church but about the wider nation and how how we flourish together uh, I'm going to hand over to Grace now. Thank you Elizabeth uh, it's a real pleasure to join in tonight um I too, like Philip, think this is an absolutely great read. It's, it, it's, it's just a good story. I always like reports, or social scientific reports, whatever kind of reports, where real people say real things. Uh, and this, this report is absolutely full of that. Um, in the, the big chapter where those key themes that Hannah talked about, they're wonderfully illustrated with, 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 with episodes and people you can relate to. Um, but I'm going to now go in a different direction. If you like, Philip brought a theological dimension to the, to the work and to the bigger picture. I'm going to go in a sociological direction because that's, that's what I'm trained to do. Um, and what I really want to say is I like the paradox that, that holds the report right at the beginning, that although the church is shrinking numerically, by all the conventional measurement, um, it's increasing its um, commitment to an involvement in social action. Now, how do we get our minds around this? But what I really want to say is this paradox is much deeper and broader. Um, what Hannah is highlighting, what this report highlight, is highlighting is one dimension of something much bigger. Um, okay, the numbers go down because maybe we're not counting the right things or we're looking in the wrong direction or the lens is wrong or the specs need changing. Um, but I have noticed that, you know, our numbers drop, but the debate about religion in public life grows exponentially. Uh, we talk about nothing else. We don't do it very well. Uh, theos apart, of course, it does it superbly. But, but much of the public debate in, in, in this country and others, I feel rather ashamed of. Um, but it's part of the same thing. Um, the debate, I think, is driven by growing diversity, religious diversity of other faiths. And do remember other faith communities are very much doing the same thing as the Church of England. Um, it isn't a, a Christian preserve this, it's broader. Um, uh, I think this debate, this dichotomy, is driven by um, increasing inequalities. Equality is, 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 you know, we're becoming less equal in our society. And, and this is where um, the church is filling a space and doing all sorts of things that um, in a way, uh, are we surprised or not? I think that's quite an interesting thing to think about. Uh, do we take it for granted or should we highlight it more? And I really like the way Hannah has gone about this and, and put this on the table, but the paradox is bigger. I also think the canvas is broader in a very different way. Um, I know about and have participated in quite a lot of European work, uh, which, which is, is going in the same direction. And you find that historic churches in many European societies are doing much more in terms of social action than they used to be. It's a broader trend um, that, that, that than simply England or Britain or however you want to define it. Um, the same financial and dem demographic pressures are, are apply in each of those places. Um, financial pressures, particularly after um, the 2008 recession, exposed a lot of countries um, to um, a welfare state that couldn't quite live up to its reputation of caring from the cradle to the grave. Uh, and the other thing that happens is demographic pressures because we get older and need more care and, 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 and the welfare state can't keep up. And that's happening all over Europe, but we need at the same time to recognize the specificities of each case. This is a brilliant case study of, of what's happening in parts of Britain. Do remember it's happening elsewhere. But it does vary quite a lot because in some places the welfare state's held up better or is more comprehensively financed and in some places the church is much wealthier and so it doesn't need volunteers because it's got far more paid staff so you need specificity as well but one of the things that i think is really very interesting in in this country 
and I would highlight it, and I think Hannah gets it as well, is that the volunteering is going increasingly over the religious secular divide. Um, it's becoming part of civil society. Uh, uh, and if there's folk here who, who are coming from the civil society or the secular side, um, I think these new marriages and these new interconnections are really um, very important. Remember though, that all religions have two things which make them really um, central to this debate. Um, almost all of them carry an ethic of care. Philip has articulated that beautifully. Um, that, that is part of their narrative but they also have networks through which to express it. And it's that combination that, that really does make their potential particularly high. Uh, and that potential is increasingly or should be increasingly realized. And my last point, which as it's, I want to say that the picture is bigger or Hannah's got it, but, but, but think big, look up and out is, is COVID. And I, I, I think um, COVID exposes a bigger problem but it, uh, and a greater need and the difficulty of meeting it. But COVID also is um, exposing new opportunities, new ways of working, new, new potential, if you like. Um, and the one that I really find extremely interesting is the way that a big body of volunteers in the church are people like me. They're older, um, some men, lots of women. And we got very firmly kicked into touch because we were told to go home and, and, and take care of ourselves. You couldn't come to the food bank because you, you were vulnerable, you, were, you, you, were, you would be a problem. Um, who came instead? Lots of furloughed people who, who had free time, very happy to come through a church network to offer something. Lots of examples of where the church was the only person or place where you could do this. And I think this is somewhere where the church should really look forwards to find new, new sources of volunteers, but who are very willing to work through um, what you might call more traditional networks. And one thing I really want to see CEOs do um, once you've signed, on, signed off on this is okay, but, but don't give up now because there's a huge task for someone to document what has happened through the churches of all kinds in all places in this country and beyond um, because of COVID. Now we've heard a lot, at least we haven't heard a lot from the National Church. The National Church in some ways has been oddly silent and there's been rather a lot, uh, I, I, I'm a little hesitant to say this, of saying um, the things you can't do, you shouldn't, you mustn't, you, you, you must be careful. And I respect that, uh, the risks are high, but under the radar, and Hannah used that term at the beginning, which I think is, is absolutely central, my word, there's a lot going on. Uh, but it's a story that has not yet been told. Now there is a big research space for a team that Theos has got, now go for it, please. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Grace. And we're going to have some final remarks from Dame Julia Unwin, who is chair of the Independent Inquiry into the Future of Civil Society and sadly couldn't be with us tonight, but has sent a short video. I want to start by congratulating Theos and the Church Urban Fund on this incredibly significant piece of research. In 2018, um, an inquiry called the Inquiry into the Future of Civil Society in England, which I had the privilege of chairing, reported. And I've been reflecting, reading this report and reflecting back on the Civil Society Futures Inquiry, and also the extraordinary and community and life-changing events of 2020, on what we have learned and what we now know. In 2018, we said, that people across England, and we listened and learned and spent hours with more than 3,000 people, were passionately committed to their place, that they felt very strongly about the part of the country they came from. And whether it was a village, a neighborhood, a housing estate or a community, they felt passion, pride, and a sense of belonging. But they also felt the lack of spaces and places where they could come together. They felt that they were being more and more divided along grounds of demography, 
income and wealth, race and ethnicity. So the issue of space and place was central to what we heard. Closely associated with that was the desire to belong. The sense that what we do when we're not paid to do it, not having to do it by law, but because we choose to do it, whether it's joining a choir or working in an allotment society, visiting your neighbours, taking part in your community, is part of what makes people's lives worth living. And up and down the country, people told us that belonging to something really mattered. Now, many things have changed in the way we belong. But one of the most profound changes that we identified is people's relationship to work. That work, which was for so long, for so many of us, a place of belonging, of association, of fellowship, was no longer offering that. And so there was a hunger for new and different places to belong. And the third thing we heard was that people really cared, that they had a sense of commitment to their neighbours. All three of these findings were amplified and strengthened by our experience since March 2020. When the country went into lockdown, there was an explosion of social solidarity, of people helping their neighbours, of people coming together in the place they live, a sense that people's location and where they lived really mattered, a longing to belong. Now, I'd be the first to say this has been tested and tested over the year. And there has been the good, the solidarity, the mutual aid societies, the fantastic work that the churches have done. But there has also been the ugly and the difficult and the appalling revelation through this year of the pain and discord created by racism in our society. All of that was prefigured in the report of the Civil Society Futures Inquiry and seen more and more strongly as we go through this difficult year and maybe months ahead. What the GRACE report has found echoes a lot of that. It echoes the desire to belong. It echoes the importance of place. It echoes, I believe, also the need to generate spaces in which people can meet. And it echoes that sense of profound social solidarity, which we talked about in our report and which has been so evident in the last year. As we go forward out of this crisis, it matters that we shape our civil society, take back some of that much lamented control and make sure that our churches, our community organisations, our civil society organisations have the power and the accountability to build those really deep connections because without those human connections we have learned to our cost that public trust is hard to gain easy to lose i'm so sorry i'm not with you this evening but i do want to join in celebrating this important landmark report thank you so much uh, to julia in absentia Absentia. Um, that is uh, the closing of our remarks from our panelists, which means it is over to you. The chat box will shortly be opening. A reminder, please keep your questions uh, short to the point and with a question mark on the end, and uh, that will really help the team as we try and fit in as many as we can. I'm gonna kick off with one that was sent in in advance, which is about the fact that much of the church growth literature has focused on urban contexts. So I'm gonna ask Hannah to speak to any particular findings, stories or themes that emerged about what this means for rural parishes and for group ministry parishes and for, I guess, other organizations uh, working in those contexts. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, so just to stress that um, a third of the case studies were in rural parishes. Um, so, and we also did a, a round table with a group of rural missioners from uh, dioceses across the country. So it's something we've been very mindful of in the report. Um, and I think one of the um, one of the key findings about the differences between rural churches and urban churches in this regard is as much about language as it is uh, about actual reality and um, we found a, a, an assumption I think that uh, discipleship as a kind of programmatic uh, thing that churches do is assumed as being a thing for large urban churches that's not to say that the actual reality of discipleship 
discipling people and um, living lives like Jesus is something that you could only do if you're in a large urban church, but that the language of discipleship is something that happens formally and is associated with larger, more or, uh, more urban churches. Um, and then that was reflected also in how people spoke about social action. I think in more rural contexts, it's something of a stereotype, but it's, it's more informal. Um, informal social happen social action happens everywhere um, but the idea that social action is a project is a food bank or is something that you do that you can um for example something that you could do that you could list on your website under the headline these are the social action projects we do that's harder to do if it's something less tangible um in terms of just informal networks of relationships which are often um quite tight-knit in rural contexts so i think it's um you, yeah, you mentioned that a lot of the, the literature refers to urban churches and I think there is a perception because of that that discipleship and social action as concepts um, or as linguistic concepts apply mainly to particular types of churches um, but actually what we found is that all of those things are happening they're just happening slightly more informally and slightly um, perhaps more under the radar actually as, as Grace said in in rural contexts. Thank you, Hannah. And um, I'm going to ask the church leaders on the panel to each give uh, one very concise answer to this. Um, uh, we've had several people saying, uh, you know, what is the number one recommendation for how you could apply this research in your parish? So um, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to pick on, um, I'm going to pick on Gr Reverend Graham. Uh, and then go to Father Richard and then uh, to Bishop Philip. You have one sentence of the one thing you think that those who are church leaders could take from this research and start applying in their parishes. Points to those who can do it most concisely. Um, root all of your action in listening. Never underestimate the power of a one-to-one -to, -one to discover the real needs and real concerns of the people in your community and build alliances for change. That was a long sentence, but I probably just about counts. Um, Father Richard. Um, I, I think I'd say see the see the members of the congregation and the people that you meet through your social action as potential uh, leaders of others so that this thing can continue. Um, rather than uh, just an invitation or introductory point. Um, see the people you meet as leaders. And finally, Bishop Philip. Um, build an intentional culture of hospitality, which needs to be combined with an intentional culture of invitation. Uh, when I managed to escape this job and go back to being a parish priest, the first person I would employ would be a chef. That's very interesting and concise and provocative. I like it. Um, thank you. Uh, I am going to ask one of the advanced questions that came in, and um, perhaps I will just stick with you, Bishop Philip. Sorry to pick on you as uh, uh, maybe one of the more senior representatives of the National Church. Something that Grace picked up on, and it's come through in a few questions, the disconnect between the active engagement of the local churches and the visibility of the National Church. Is there anything you'd like to say to that um, and how that might kind of connect with what, where the research is pulling? I, I, do, I mean, you know, it's a, I think it's a generalization we've heard a lot um, in the last few months about the invisibility of the National Church. And I, I'd, love, I'd, love to, I'd love to talk to somebody and find out what exactly they mean. Because actually, if you look at, if you analyze the media hits the Church of England is getting, it's very, very high. If you look over the last few weeks, the number of times our archbishops have made the news, it's been almost on a daily basis. And sometimes it's been reassuring, sometimes it's been apologizing, sometimes it's been challenging. So I don't quite know where this story comes in. I think we were a bit taken on the back foot in the very early days and weeks of the pandemic. But I'd really love to see that justified, that claim that the National Church has been silent. I do agree totally about the heroism of the local church. The agility of the local church has been breathtaking in this a pandemic. And the speed with which local church, you know, anybody who says parish life is over and on the shelf, the agility of the parochial structure has just been astonishing in recent months. But I would, I would hit back a bit saying the National Church has been, has been silent, I think, probably. 
Thank you. And there's a question from Heather Black about a shorter resource with key findings. The answer to that is yes. Uh, we will be producing um, a range of other things. There are some stories on the website. Uh, go to Cuff's web website. They will be um, uh, creating as many possible pathways for people to access this research in ways that are appropriate and accessible for them as possible. So, because we know not everyone wants to wade through a 20,000 word um, report. Hannah, I'm gonna to come to you. We have a question about buildings. What did you find about buildings and the relationship between social action, discipleship and growth? Uh, so the first thing I would say on that um, is in the, the presence chapter of the report that um, although I wouldn't want to say that the aesthetics of a church building are uh, critical to, to its ministry, actually the, it, the where, whether or not the building looks open um, is a really strong sign to the community that the church mm. is there. There are plenty of stories, I touched on these earlier, of, um, of places where the church looked closed and so local residents who were not part of the church at all assumed it was closed and were really surprised actually to discover that there was a thriving church community there um, and actually in plenty of those examples it wasn't that the church was doing nothing um, there was the church was running services running a food bank running toddler groups but it looked closed um, whether that was because it was a little bit run down and tatty or whether that was simply because the doors were always shut um, there was one example in in the report of a church where the only time and they told me this the only time mo both of the front doors of the church building are open uh, were for a funeral because you had to have it open to fit a coffin in um, but any other time at least one of the doors was shut um, and actually that co communicates to the community that um, yes we think we're open to you they're running a cafe called open doors but actually you, you can't get in um, and so actually the way the building the building present I think what I want to say is that the building communicates more to the community than you might be aware of um, even if your your actions and your kind of your intention is to be open to the community sometimes the building can uh, can hinder that um, and that's not to say it needs to be really shiny and beautiful and brilliant, um, but it does need to at least look like there's some life happening in the church. Um, and, when it, and when it does, that's often critical for, um, for the church growth and also for the growth of social action. So people can't, you know, in purely practical terms, people can't come to a food bank that they don't know exists, um, nor can people come to a worshipping service that they, doesn't know, they don't know is happening, and nor can they join a worshipping community that they assume is, is dead and gone. Um, so I think something along those lines is really important. Thank you. And we've had various questions both in advance and now about a more ecumenical focus. The design of this project was very specifically looking at the Church of England and, and that's what it's done. Um, we have uh, some research coming out towards the end of this month uh, with the Free Churches Commission, where we're partnering with the Free Churches Group about the role of social cohesion, um, the social cohesion role that churches play, which is a much br uh, broader uh, view across the churches and much of our research and um, elsewhere is but yes as many of you have noticed this is just about the church of england um i want to ask one that i think uh sums up the tensions that a lot of people might say of this which is um is there a danger that people will feel that social justice is a means to an end that people are just being served in order to evangelize them if we see this uh, connection being more um tightly knitted and I'm going to ask uh, Father Richard that just to see to see what you think on that. Um, I don't think there need there need to be a danger about that. I think that the those people who are um, find themselves uh, in churches and wanting to minister through social action, I think there's a need for those people to recognise the connections and the motivations that come from the gospels. Um, but as has been said, I think both by the report and people who have responded, uh, the, the, the success through social action for church growth is built on relationships um, and uh, on a sacred conversation. Um, and so those things are worked out in the very stuff of life, whether that is in a food bank or over a coffee, um, as opposed to uh, a strategic plan within the church for outreach. Um, this, this is relational activity. Um, and that involves up and down question and, and answer, ponder uh, and response. And so uh, I think while these things are driven by relationships, uh, then you tackle what comes. If someone is skeptical or cynical, then that's the stuff of relationship. I think uh, those people who are carrying out the social action, their recognition of this is being driven from what they find in the gospels and being preached to them on Sundays uh, is what counts. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Bishop Philip uh, because you said we need to 
reclaim the word evangelism and we have a question from someone saying actually they think it's easier to help people practically than it is to uh, talk about Jesus and so uh, what do you think about this relationship is there a danger that people will go okay well we can just do the social action bit and not um, lean into that discomfort of sharing their motivations yeah I mean you know I suppose if people go away thinking this report that you're running a food bank, everybody who comes by, you need to say, I want to tell you about Jesus. Um, that would not be the result we want. Um, you know, I think bearing witness to why we're doing things is rather more subtle than that. So I think, first of all, you know, making it clear that our projects are motivated by the fact that we're Christians following Jesus Christ. That's that's one way in which we do it. Um, uh, proper relationship listening intensely to people and being interested in them actually makes you stand out in a crowd being interested in them for who they are before you've done any listening offering to pray for somebody can be a huge way of witnessing being aware of who your volunteers are when I was in Camden the growth came from volunteers not from users of social action projects invitation you know that, that before we've kind of started banging on about who Jesus Christ is simple invitation and then then being aware of the opportunities when people want to ask more because most people do want to find out what motivates so you know we're, you're talking a much more subtle gentle nuanced approach I think than just trying to make every conversation kind of crassly evangelistic it's about the whole way in which things are done and the intentionality with which things are done Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Reverend Graham to come in because I think I uh, have, <laughs> in amongst the many faces, uh, seen a, an indication that you'd like to add something. Thanks, Elizabeth. J just because I think this is such a fascinating dynamic uh, for us and often in our congregation, we try to help leaders think about living with that paradox that, um, and, I, and I love it, I think the sort of point is made, I think, by Tom Wright in one of his commentaries on the Gospels, that when Jesus is summarizing the greatest commandment, he says that the greatest commandment is love God, and the greatest commandment is love your neighbor. It's not first and second, they're first and first. Um, and I often use that to think about the paradox of the fact that, in a way, the most important thing, the, super, the principal thing that we are doing is seeking for people to experience what it means to be reconciled to God in Jesus Christ. Um, and everything else is window dressing. And at the same time, what we're seeking to do is make manifest the kingdom of God uh, and through the flourishing of our communities, irrespective of whether anybody ever comes to know Jesus and put their faith in him. And uh, sometimes with our kind of congregation, we just try to communicate that and say, you just got to hold that tension, walk that tightrope. And Hannah's report ends with that um, illustration about the wings of an aeroplane, uh, which I really, really like. Uh, <laughs> but I think I want to push it even further um, there's sometimes said it's not either or, it's both and. But I think it can go further still. I don't think it needs to be both and. I think it can be not unless. It's not evangelism unless it's also social justice uh, and embodying the mission of the kingdom of God. And it's not mission of the kingdom of God unless it's also a proclamation of Jesus who is the source and object of all of this work. Uh, so I think the not unless category is a way of holding those things together. Thank you. And we've got various questions coming in about younger people, uh, particularly whether this kind of focus might help connect with younger people or the ways in which growth is happening amongst younger people. So I'm going to go to Hannah to see if that um, came up in the research and then over to Grace, because I think you might have some insights on this from your kind of wider understanding of the sociological landscape. Right. Yeah. So I think the two uh, the two findings that are most relevant to uh, younger people are uh, the one about uh, relationships. So the fact that uh, church grows through relationship, I think that's really important in terms of bringing in uh, younger people into the church through genuine, authentic relationships so that they don't feel like they're kind of being got at and brought in for, for kind of false pretenses. But also the one about participation. Um, I think we've heard a lot about um yeah, about kind of how young people want to, to get involved in stuff and to, to participate. Um, actually, my generation, the millennial generation, is really hard done by in terms of being really entitled. I think that's not actually true. I think there's a real willingness to get involved and to do stuff. We saw that particularly with the pandemic. So um, there's some research done that the majority of mutual aid groups were powered by younger people who were on furlough, um, who had the time to volunteer. Um, and that suggests, I think, that... Um, that young people want to get involved it's not that they 
they don't have the, the willingness or the capacity um, it's perhaps they don't have the time and what we saw with with furlough people being kind of changes in their employment patterns and things is that when they had that time to spare they did want to give it to being an NHS volunteer responder being um, helping their neighbour and all of those things so I think it's really critical to remember um, that actually the church being the church through its social action looks most like what people outside of it expect it to be um, and that's what's most attractive I think it doesn't have to be um, just thinking of kind of attraction in terms of worship services um, kind of geared towards younger people but actually it's really attractive when people see uh, the authentic life of the church expressed towards the community and um, that draws people in and it's very much something people want to want to become part of. Grace is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, Hannah said quite a bit of it, um, but I, I just 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 think a, a little bit, you know, open it up a bit. Um, if I look through my lifetime, the sort of sources of volunteers have changed. Um, there were, um, I mean, I can remember it quite clearly, um, a lot of women who, who were not working, uh, who had quite a lot of time, um, uh, uh, that they'd raised families, sometimes they went back to work, sometimes they didn't, and a lot of them volunteered very, very effectively and did all sorts of things. Then that demographic moved back into the workplace, it's, it's changed. And the next bunch that turned up were um, early retired. Um, and they became a source of um, uh, the kind of people who you would very likely find in the working in food banks or all sorts of things, charity shops, uh, dozens and dozens of things. Um, that I now there's a new group that are coming and I think this is interesting because a, a, a quite a lot of young people are coming now and one of the things that you're beginning to see if you look at people's CVs is if you have experience of volunteering and commitment it's now thought of as a plus rather than oh gosh they couldn't get a job um, so I think we're beginning to perceive um, or young people are beginning to perceive not only I simply want to volunteer, but that what I do is valued um, uh, uh, and I can commit and it's going to be recognised. Lots and lots of students volunteer during their student lives now. Um, now, go back to the point I made about how this happens, where the, where the volunteering or the labour exchange for volunteers takes place. Now, churches were absolutely prime sites for this because you don't become a volunteer just because you get up in the morning and say, today's the day I'm going to volunteer. You do it because you meet somebody or you know somebody who says, for example, I'm a prison visitor and I think you'd be great if you did this. There's a training day on Saturday. Why don't you come with me? This is how it works. It works through personal connection and churches were admirable places um, where that kind of exchange, uh, 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 getting to know each other and recognizing talent and some of the teaching in the church could be behind this um, happened. Now, I think younger people do this in different ways. They do it on social media. If you're, if you're short of people to do this or that or the other, you don't go to a church coffee board and you go to whatever you do on social media and you find your, um, your, your colleagues or your, your possible colleagues. Now, what I think is so interesting about COVID, this is really why I want this work done, is that suddenly the, there was a completely new resource of volunteers. And they went, many of them, not all, but many of them found their ways into operations that were either incipient or already happening, where the elderly, the older ones had to step back. And I think that was a very, very interesting dynamic that really does um, merit our attention. And what's gonna happen? Is this going to persist or is it all gonna be all over? Are we going to build back better in, in, in all sorts of new involvements? And that's why I think that, that the post-COVID is going to be such an interesting place to look. Can I just come back and um, mention as well, Grace mentioned there about students. Um, I think it's probably worth saying that the reason I am in the job that I'm in, if I trace it back to um, to kind of where, where it started and where I would trace back what, what I'm doing, um, is the church that I was part of when I was a student um, in Durham, which every summer when we'd finished our exams and we had all these this summer spreading ahead of us, um, dedicated the, the first week of the holidays to social action. Um, and it was called June Project. And it was everyone's favorite week of the year where you know a couple of hundred students got together um, 
and actually the stories that I know of of people who have who were part of that and have now gone on to do um, all sorts of different things with with their careers and with their lives. Um, it's really, really foundational in, in so many people's stories. And I think just offering that um, the opportunity while people are young to, to give back and while, you know, while, while students have plenty of time um, is certainly the kind of the, the genesis of, of me doing what I'm doing now. Um, and that's true for so many other people I know. So um, definitely to give a just to give a shout out to June Project, really, because it was it was quite incredible. Thank you, Hannah. And um, we are getting quite a few questions about measurement. One of the recommendations is obviously about reassessing the way the Church of England measures uh, how a church is doing, um, what size it is, whether it's whether it's growing or not. And um, Hannah, do you want to say a little a little bit? I know this is something that we really just need to uh, recommend to the central um, church bodies to take on. Um, so you won't have a kind of designed plan for it, but what that might look like. And then with my kind of more former journalist um, head on knowing that uh, I spend a lot of time with people who might be more hostile to the role of the church they might say is this just a way of cooking the books so that the Church of England looks bigger than it is yeah um, so those of the who know me who know me will know I could talk uh, talk all day about the intricacies of how we measure this stuff and the methodologies um, and I won't bore you with that but suffice to say that at the moment um, the way in the Church of England they measure whether or not a church is growing is over a 10-year period um, based on metrics which are still um, predominantly about attendance at worshipping services. Um, so the worshipping community is a metric that was introduced a few years ago which does seek to kind of expand the way we measure that and um, which is something I really welcome but I do think as I said earlier it could go further. Um, and to answer your question as well is that's not about cooking the books it's about telling um, telling a better story in terms of a more accurate story rather than um, needlessly a more positive story. Um, where growth is happening um, it's true to say that it is not just happening in Sunday mornings in fact kind of the um, or in Sunday services actually the minority of it is happening there um, and it's so that in order to tell it to tell a um, a truer and richer story about what where the Church of England is and what it's doing, I think we need to expand the way in which that's measured, um, not only for the purposes of kind of showing us, but you know, to show us where, um, to show us where growth is happening, not um, to show that growth is happening just so that we can say that it is happening. Um, but actually, if, if it is happening, it's really important that we're able to say how. Um, and I think our current, me current metrics don't uh, accurately or don't adequately allow us to say how and where it is happening. Would any of the um, other panelists, perhaps one of the church leaders, like to come in on that? No pressure. Mm -hmm. I would say as well that I don't want, um, it, however, however this is done, um, it needs to be contextual, as we said earlier. And I also don't want it to be done in uh, in such a way that it's just another thing for um, for Graham and Richard, particularly, to have to count. Um, we don't want to put kind of just another thing that they're having to to fill in a box on a form for. Um, for its own sake. Um, it has to be something that is reflective of the things that they're already trying to count, the things that are already important and valued in the life of uh, the parish church, rather than just a, an additional thing that um, is another eye rolling pressure to be to be filled in at the end of the year. If I can comment briefly, I think Richard and I will both share um, some tools that we are both using in our context here in East London to think about how we measure growth and change. And uh, particularly these past few months, uh, the challenge of trying to work out how on earth you record a usual Sunday attendance when you're on Facebook Live and you've got an embedded video stream in your website and you don't know who watched it synchronously all at the same time and who watched it later. And when does a three second scroll past count as a view and when does a one minute view count as a attendance and, you know, wrestling with all these things. Um, we've had to think a lot more about how we assess the fruitfulness and the health of our churches and um, one approach that we've adopted here in Hoxton is just uh, we're fortunate to have a database which gives us a bit some of the support to do this but we've tried to count how many people are serving on some kind of a team at the moment we've got you know we have uh, there's a new kids connect group that's just started today online and the volunteer leaders who are helping with that or the people who are serving and volunteering at the food bank um, or the people who were making the care calls at the height of the first lockdown. How do we record all those and recognise that there are people who might not attend on a Sunday, but might well be serving the mission of the church in other ways? Um, and then how are people belonging? Um, many people in smallish, mid-sized inner city parishes struggle with the kind of the, the, the up and down of 
uh, pressures of shift work and life in establishing those sort of midweek small groups. Um, but actually, for the first time in 10 years, we have midweek small groups which are actually kind of working and meeting and thriving and flourishing. So there's so we're looking at the belonging and we're looking at the serving as as well as the attending. Um, and of course, we're looking at the giving because we always do look at the giving as well. Uh, but then the other thing that uh, Rich and I would share was uh, a tool that the Centre for Theology and Community developed um, around hallmarks of an organised church, which is to try and think about different qualitative ways of understanding how people can articulate their faith, how people can tell the story of uh, their church in their context, how people can lead public action, how they can form relationships. And actually trying to, um, I became a bit of a data geek with conditional formatting on spreadsheet cells earlier this year and discovered that you can make cells change color according to the number that you plug into it. So you can actually watch cells change from kind of green to red or red to green or whatever you want um, and track change through time. And that's become really interesting for us to think about how do we chart change over time and measure that and celebrate that rather than simply take a snapshot of numbers. Um, sorry if that makes me a bit of a data geek, but. Graham, uh, if you ever leave the church, you can come join the Theos research team. I think you've <laughs> <laughs> oh, My day has come. I love a good spreadsheet as everyone well knows, so. <laughs> but I hope- Can I add want... a- Please go ahead. Can I add a, 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 perhaps a story to Graham's uh, geekiness? Um, just, uh, I, I, there's a guy in my church who uh, has been in the church for 50 odd years and he's Christopher. So he and I set up for mass on a Sunday quite early. Uh, this is before the pandemic. And he volunteered a lot of his time around his full-time job uh, with the homeless. But he said to me that morning, do you know, uh, Father Richard, I feel called by God to the homeless. And there was this really distinct, he was making a distinction between volunteering his time with the homeless, whatever it was that he was doing, to now being called by God. We might have described what he was doing before as a calling, but he didn't. There was something that had uh, changed in his mind between just the giving of his time to something which felt uh, was at more depth for him. And I'd love to work out how to measure that kind of formational journey, because if he'd said I was called to be, he's called to be a priest, uh, all sorts of resources would open up for him in the Church of England if the church agreed with him on that. Um, but because he felt called to this particular thing, it was difficult uh, to uh, to work out what that journey is and how he's seeing it. I'm sure he's not alone in that. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Um, very sadly, we are coming towards uh, the close of the evening. Uh, I'm going to hand over shortly to Bishop Adrian uh, just for some closing remarks. But I will say that Hannah has spent... Uh, three years of blood, sweat and tears uh, and many, many uh, stays in premier inns and um, lonely evenings in Pizza Express, traveling the country and coming back always absolutely pumped uh, with what the incredible diversity of the Church of England, just the Church of England, let alone all of the other beautiful and amazing expressions of church up and down the country are doing and she would be delighted to be in contact with you to talk about it to maybe come speak if you have a context in which you'd like her to come and speak in so this is not uh, closing down the conversation but it's just for tonight I'm going to hand over uh, to Bishop Adrian and then I'll do a couple of um, closing remarks um, and then those of you who wish to stay for breakout rooms we would love to connect with you. Well, it falls to me to say a number of things uh, very fairly briefly as our evening draws to a close. The most important things to say are thanks, I think. A lot of thanks to, uh, to pass on to people here. A huge thanks to Theos for your partnership, for the excellent delivery of this report and of the launch tonight. Um, your work at Theos is, oh, well, I'm sure you know this, although you wouldn't brag about it. It's of a consistently high caliber. And the church is blessed beyond measure to have you as the critical friend that you are to us. So thank you so much for all that you have done in this giving this report to us. Big thank you to the project group and the um, the, the steering group and advisory group uh, for their expert guidance and support over the course of the past three years. You've been a fantastic midwife to this project and we're hugely grateful. Thank you to the funders, very important to say this, the uh, Sir Halley Stewart Trust and the Hartham Church Charitable Trust. Thank you so much. Uh, literally without your support, this wouldn't have happened. So thank you very much indeed, if you are watching tonight. Huge thanks to you, Elizabeth, and to Hannah in particular, but also to all of our panelists tonight for your various contributions, uh, for casting a vision in which church growth and discipleship and social action dance together rather than apart. 
for stimulating our thinking and for inspiring us to all sorts of creative actions. And last but not least, a big thank you to everybody who has participated in the call this evening by signing up and by tuning in. Many of us on this call tonight, and there have been hundreds and hundreds um, on the call this evening, have been around long enough to know that reports like this often arrive with a bit of razzmatazz and too often end up as yesterday's fish and chip paper. Um, I think all of us at CUF, and I'm sure at Theos as well, are determined to keep the findings of this research and this report very much alive. We called the evening a launch, and that was quite deliberate. It's always good to crack open some champagne across the bowels of a significant piece of work. And we've done that tonight, and now it sort of slides down a slipway into the open sea, and the voyage proper begins. So on the back of this research, and I say this particularly in response to some of the questions I've seen come up in the, uh, in the, on the chat tool tonight. On the back of this research, the Church Urban Fund will develop some very practical tools for dioceses and for parishes to use. Please look out for these on the Church, uh, Church Urban Fund website. They will be coming soon. At the end of this month, CUF is launching an online living theology forum, which I will be curating. This is a spa space to reflect together on the theology of Christian social action, a meeting place for the mutual exchange of shared ideas. And it's something that won't be static. It can be built on, added to, developed, critiqued as time goes by. Do check it out as it goes live towards the end of this month. And again, you can access it through the Cuff website. And if you want to contribute, please let me know. My last closing comment is really to say the reason that I am committing time and, en and energy to the Church Urban Fund is because I think this pandemic has brought us to the cusp of an important moment for church and for society. It's amplified what Pope Francis said last year about not so much living through an era of change, but a change of era. Things are not going to be the same again. And I think the church is going to need organizations like CAF, like Theos, to help it incarnate a mission that holds social action, discipleship, and church growth together in a sort of prayerful harmony. So as we head out into the open sea, champagne drizzling down the bowels of this report. Thank you all for coming and for participating in this important conversation. Keep in touch, keep the faith, and God bless all of you tonight and always. Thank you so much, Adrian. I feel like I should just wipe some champagne off <laughs> my head. Um, uh, I'd add my thanks particularly to the Theos events team who've handled it so well tonight. And uh, Bishop Adrian alluded to the fact that both Cuff and Theos are charitable organisations and rely on, uh, yes, funders for big projects, but also individuals to donate to us on a regular basis. If you have valued the work of Theos tonight, please do sign up to be a friend or an associate. It helps you journey with us and you will receive regular printed copies of our reports, invitations to events like this, and you'll support our calling to bring a credible, thoughtful, gracious perspective uh, into public conversations about what the role of Christianity in particular and religion in general can be. We rely on our, gen our generous supporters and for those of you who are here tonight who are already friends and associates, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, it really, really encourages us in our work. Thank you so much for coming and good night. <laughs>